Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jane Huckabee. I direct the International Human Rights Clinic at Duke Law School. And it is my great pleasure to be welcoming everyone to the second event in our series, COVID-19, Advancing Rights and Justice During a Pandemic. The series is co-convened by four organizations, Columbia Law School's Human Rights Institute, uh, the Duke Law International Human Rights Clinic, Columbia Law School's Center for Gender and Sexuality Law, and just security. Today's event really carries on from the one that we had on Tuesday to take a much deeper dive into identifying the impacts of COVID-19 on marginalized groups and the implications those differential impacts have for both policy and advocacy in this space. To guide us through these questions and to think about the, this topic in more depth, we have three exceptional panelists. Uh, the first of which is Amanda Classing, who is the acting co-director of the Women's Rights Division at Human Rights Watch. And we then have uh, Sharanya Krishnaswamy, who is the America's Advocacy Director at Amnesty International USA. And then we have Vince Warren, who is the Executive Director at the Center for Constitutional Rights. We'll be proceeding in a format of having each panelist give approximately a 10 minute presentation, uh, followed by moderated Q&A. If you have questions that you would like to pose to our panel, please feel free to tweet those using hashtag COVID-19 justice. Again, that's hashtag COVID-19 justice. And please also use the chat function on Zoom to um, share questions with our um, organizer and we'll do our best to ask the questions that you might have. And with that, I'm handing over to Amanda Classing from Human Rights Watch. Thanks so much, Jane, and thank you all to the sponsors of the, the um, event. Obviously, this is, um, you know, a need that has been filled by, by these organizations with so many participants on the line. This is an excellent opportunity for practitioners to come together and think about um, where the human rights movement can be in positioning ourselves to support uh, both the response and the, the recovery efforts around the COVID uh, crisis. So I just wanted to flag for everybody that Human Rights Watch um, last week, well, the weeks are running together, two weeks ago, <laughs> um, published a, a look at some of the human rights implications of the coronavirus response. We identified a number of areas that governments have an important role to play and have human rights obligations around, including access to information, looking at people in custody, detention, or in institutions, the unique and specific needs of healthcare workers and low-wage workers, the need to combat stigma, um, both of, of healthcare workers, of people that have been identified as quarantined for, for COVID or have been recovered from COVID and other, um, other stigma concerns. Looked at access to health care for marginalized populations, the need for water and sanitation to really fulfill the rights to water and sanitation. But we also had a specific section looking at the disparate impacts on women and girls. What we know is that there is always a disparate impact on marginalized populations and it's intersectional. So we're concerned, of course, about people with disabilities, older people, and particularly uh, some of the concerning responses to limiting the, the autonomy and authority of, of older people over decision-making, LGBT individuals, children, and others. But for women and girls, we really know that crisis impacts them differently. We know this because we've done research looking at the Zika epidemic, at the Ebola crisis in, in various countries in Africa over the last six years. And we know that in humanitarian crises and conflict and other types of conflicts or concerns, women and girls experience uh, response efforts differently than others. The ch challenge here is that the scale is so much bigger, it's hard to anticipate all of the ways that this crisis will play out in impacting women and girls' rights. That said, we've identified a couple of key areas that are important to have um, visibility over, even in this acute phase, but certainly in the long, longer term impact of the crisis. 
The first thing I want to flag is that women workers are a particularly vulnerable set of, of um, individuals within this crisis for a variety of reasons that are historic to the gender discrimination that has existed in the economy. In some countries, 95% of female workers are in the informal sector, where there's no job security and no safety nets. Uh, and a crisis like COVID will destroy their earnings and also there won't be any, any um, paid sick leave or any sort of recovery effort that really addresses their unique needs unless uh, governments take action now to do so. 70% of healthcare workers globally are women. Um, that means that any of the, the concerns that we have about healthcare workers is, is a gendered concern. We need to make sure that there's uh, enough protection, personal protective equipment, but also that stigma is not reinforced and that women and women that work in the healthcare sector can continue to care for their families as they care for patients. But we also know that women could conduct more than 2.5 times more domestic work and care work in the homes than men globally. And in this crisis, when people are in the home more, that added burden of trying to protect families' health, trying to keep um, hygiene in the home high, protecting and taking care of people that have fallen sick, and also caregiving work when children are out of school are going to disproportionately fall on women. And when there is a, already a significant gender pay gap in, in globally, if there is somebody that's going to have to give up work in order to make sure that children are cared for or others in the house are cared for, there's going to be a disproportionate pressure on women to do so. And so we are concerned about how this uh, crisis will impact women workers in particular. There are women who are able to, to switch to telecommuting and work from home. Obviously, many of us are, are doing so, um, calling into this call. But we, the digital divide that exists globally is quite significant. Women are up to 31% less likely to have access to the internet in some countries. And worldwide, there are 327 million fewer women than men that have a smartphone. And we're thinking really about what are the household dynamics currently at play when there's only one or two devices in the home that is connected to the internet and it needs to be used to access information about the current healthcare, health crisis, um, how to protect families, how to continue to do work, and how to keep kids in school. If there are only a certain number of devices, oftentimes it won't be women who will end up having equal access or the access they need to continue productive activity or to continue their education. We're also concerned about the the restrictions of the stay-at-home orders that are happening around the world and the impact that has when you, as a woman or a girl, live at home with an abuser. We're already hearing reports of increased rates of domestic violence um, and intrafamilial violence, and that's happening at a time where freedom of movement is restricted and it becomes quite difficult then to access uh, services, to flee, to enter a shelter space. Shelters don't necessarily have the tools um, in place to ensure that there's social distancing and that they themselves are also protected. And a lot of the stay at home orders and the, the different types of orders that have been offered by governments do not include access to information about who to call or hotlines or how victims of violence continue, can continue to access services and protection that they need it under this current climate. And so we're increasingly concerned that the anecdotal reports that we're starting to hear about increases of domestic violence um, will, will lead to even greater data that demonstrates that the, the risks are quite high. When I said we've been here before, we certainly have been here before in the sense that when we look at um, rates of domestic violence and other forms of gendered violence, they certainly do increase it in, in situations of crisis and conflict um, and high, high, um, high stress and, and, high, and, and lack of access to the public space. We're also concerned about how this will impact women's health. Of course, it's a public health crisis, so it's gonna impact everybody's health. And there are some reports that the, that the um, infection rates um, and the mortality rates in countries like Italy actually are disproportionately following on men. And yet women are heavy users of the healthcare system for uh, comprehensive healthcare needs, particularly um, reproductive healthcare. And so we're 
already seeing reports where governments and, and hospitals are having to make difficult decisions about how women and girls can access the healthcare system for their routine needs, even in times of child care, childbirth. And so um, there was a reversal of this policy, but last week, some of the New York hospitals who were really on the front lines of this crisis and needing to make difficult decisions about how to preserve resources and staff were making decisions to um, not allow women to bring in attendance, um, a, a companion during child, childbirth. What we know is companions are an important part of, of women's uh, rights to, to um, it writes respecting health care or maternity care. Um, they can often provide the oversight if there's any um, obstetric violence, if there's challenges or concerns that women have. They can be advocates for women's health and preventing women from having a companion and is an extraordinary effort. And while, and I think this is a great example actually of how um, human rights practitioners who are not public health experts have to really balance what we know are the human rights standards and the human rights. Um, obligations that, that governments have with what are very acute and uh, public health crises. And what we you know, have heavily recommended is to restate what are the rights of, of women and girls that are um, at play and ensure that human rights principles then are reasserted. So in the case of the healthcare, uh, women and girls trying to, to access maternity care should be participants in deciding what alternatives are put in place if in fact the, the highest level of restriction is put in place. One of the places where we've been very firm that governments cannot restrict is access to essential health care like abortion care. We're seeing around the world that um, there is a, a opportunism in this crisis for anti-choice um, activists and, and, and governments to limit women and girls access to abortion care, um, a type of health care that cannot be postponed indefinitely and should in fact be, be accessed. So we're very concerned about the vi variety of ways that women's reproductive health care can be impacted. And finally, the last area that I wanted to highlight is um, girls' education. So there's been an extraordinary effort to increase the level of parity in education and primary education, and certainly more and more effort in secondary education. But we know that when there is a, um, a security concern or a crisis, that families are more often keeping women, girls at home than boys. And when girls are taken out of the education system, further investment in their education is often a uh, delayed or, or decided that it's not um, a priority. And that can lead to um, more pressure for child marriage. It can lead girls to have more caregiving responsibilities at home. And it also you know, has, has effects long into life. Um, once, if they are married off um, at a young age, then they can, can, they can have all um, a number of, of impacts to their health, to their economic uh, welfare, and to, uh, rates of domestic violence. So I, I ran through so many different ways. There are, of course, more um, intersectional and gendered impacts of this crisis, but these are a number of the areas that we're seeing as acute, and certainly we're looking at the long-term effects as well. Sharon. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so, so much to the sponsors uh, for hosting this forum, to Amanda for those great comments. Um, and really just uh, to all of you for creating this virtual space for us to talk about human rights. Uh, it's great to be with all of you. Uh, my name is Sharanya Krishnaswamy. I'm the America's Advocacy Director for the U.S. Section of Amnesty International, where I direct our U.S.-facing policy advocacy related to human rights in the Americas with a focus on access to asylum at the Mexico-U.S. border. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about migration and COVID-19 in the United States. I'll be focusing on some recent attacks on the right to seek asylum at the border, as well as the deeply concerning continued detention and deportation of non-citizens in the midst of this pandemic. So first I'd like to talk a little bit about what's happening with asylum right now in the United States. For a lot of us, access to asylum uh, at this moment is an emergency layered on to an existing emergency. The right to asylum has been under near constant attack since President Trump first took office. What is new is this powerful new purported justification of public health, invoking a pandemic to dress up the same xenophobia, the same discrimination, the same illegal behavior we have seen since day one. <clears throat> 
So predictably, um, upon the onset of the COVID pandemic, the first action Trump took to combat it was to issue a travel ban, which this administration appears to see as a sort of one-size-fits-all solution to every problem. On March 20th, the administration took this one step further, closing the northern and southern borders and issuing an unprecedented new order that would suspend the entry of all non-citizens without documentation at the southwest border. In practice, the vast majority of these people are asylum seekers and refugees. Thus, the rule empowers a total denial of access to asylum at the border. Now, the order was issued by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and invokes the, administration, the administration's public health authority. This particular provision empowers the administration to suspend the entry of persons or property to prevent the, quote, introduction of a communicable disease. So what does the order do in practice? It allows border agents to essentially expel, and that's the term they use, expel any non-citizen without documentation, with, without any due process whatsoever. Asylum seekers and immigrants can be expelled either to Mexico, directly pushed back, or rapidly repatriated to their countries of origin. This is a violation of international and domestic law, plain and simple. Under the Refugee Convention, and we're a party to the Refugee Protocol to the Convention, as well as under U.S. law, we have an obligation not to return people to places where they may face serious harm or torture. This is called the principle of non-refoulement or non-return. To ensure that we're complying with non-refoulement, we have to screen individuals for potential fear of return before sending them away. Now, I want to be clear that this is not an abstract moral concept. This obligation came from a global moral failure during World War II to protect people who were fleeing a genocide. We turned back people, as did many other nations, who would later lose their lives in the Holocaust. Now, the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, recently issued guidance about asylum protections in this time, in the time of COVID. And there, UNHCR made clear that states cannot enact, quote, blanket measures that circumvent the right to seek safety. Yet that is exactly what this order does. Moreover, our own laws require border officials to screen people for potential fear of harm. And that is a direct reflection of our international obligations. Now, another major concern with this rule is that it goes further than any other in dispensing with critical safeguards for unaccompanied children. Now, typically, unaccompanied children from countries other than Mexico have had access to trafficking screenings and other measures meant to protect them. These were passed by a bipartisan Congress concerned about their welfare. To date, every other anti-asylum measure this administration has implemented from safe third country agreements to the forcible return of asylum seekers to dangerous conditions in Mexico, to new rapid deportation programs, all have accepted unaccompanied children, but not this policy. And to give you just a sense of how immediate and how devastating the impact of that has been, Guatemala yesterday reported that 93 unaccompanied children were repatriated in March, compared to just 23 in February and just 16 in January. In other words, in just fewer than the two weeks that this order has been in effect, unaccompanied child deportations have already skyrocketed. So what we've seen is that the Trump administration has unilaterally overwritten decades of asylum law and laws protecting children in just a matter of two weeks by invoking this pandemic. So I want to talk a little bit about why this ban is a bad idea, obviously violating human rights, but why it's a bad idea as a matter of public health. Now, the CDC has justified this blanket ban on asylum by assuming that the only alternative um, to pushing back asylum seekers, to denying them due process, is to detain them in unsafe border facilities, the cages that we've heard so much about that have become so infamous. Now, we've long argued that these facilities are not safe. Uh, you all might remember the number of children who lost their lives after being detained there. These facilities are notoriously overcrowded, unsanitary, and unsafe. But the thing is, there's simply no need to detain people for this period of time. The administration could instead use its discretion to parole individuals into the United States. A recent study found that 92% of asylum seekers at the Mexico-U.S. border who were surveyed had family or close friends in the United States that they could safely shelter in place with. 
allowing them to do that would allow them to socially distance, to self-isolate, in keeping with public health experts' recommendations. And what's more, pushing back asylum seekers to Mexico, which this rule allows the administration to do, will force them to survive in dangerous and overcrowded conditions in Mexico. Right now, as we speak, there is a refugee camp in Matamoros, which sits on the border of um, Mexico and Texas, right across the border from Brownsville. This camp is filled with asylum seekers who have been pushed back by the United States under a policy called Remain in Mexico. With this new order, the CDC order, potentially thousands more individuals will be pushed back to Mexico to survive in these same dangerous conditions. They are all the more precarious now. A COVID-19 outbreak would be a cataclysmically bad event in these encampments. So in short, categorically denying access to asylum at the border and rapidly repatriating children and families violates human rights and is a terrible idea from a public health standpoint. The question that remains is whether the invocation of a public health justification like this one will be the final blow to the asylum regime. Now, meanwhile, despite the, public, the significant risks to public health, the rest of the deportation machine is churning onward. In terms of detention, as of last Friday, there were nearly 36,000 people in ICE detention. That's detention run by Immigration and Customs Enforcement. They are being held in absolutely tinderbox-like conditions. I want to emphasize that these people do not need to be in detention. Detention is not punishment. Its sole purported purpose is to make sure that people show up to court, which the administration can do in a lot of different ways that do not require putting people behind bars. The blanket use of immigration detention is a blatant violation of human rights uh, in normal circumstances. And in the context of this outbreak, it is nothing short of negligent. An outbreak in these, in, in these facilities could be absolutely devastating. And public health experts universally agree that detainees must be freed in the midst of this pandemic. ICE detainees have described themselves as sitting ducks just waiting for the onset of viral transmission in the places that they're forced to remain. At Amnesty International, we're calling for the release of all immigration detainees, not just in the United States, but also in other countries in the Americas that practice immigration detention, including Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean islands of Trinidad and Tobago and Curaçao. Furthermore, deportations are still continuing onward. Just this week, the Guatemalan migration authorities reported the first positive case of COVID-19 of an individual who was deported from the United States. Continuing deportations in this climate is a catastrophically bad idea. The United States is transferring individuals to places after they've been detained in the United States um, to places that, they're much more, that are much less well-equipped to deal with the crisis. The Migration Policy Institute reports that on average, the United States deports around 330,000 people per year. That's about 925 people a day. The risks of rapid transmission if deportations continue are clear. And one thing I wanna point out is just the hypocrisy of continuing detentions and deportations in this climate. I just talked to you all about uh, an order banning asylum at the southern border that's couched in public health concerns. But meanwhile, these other clearly risky practices are continuing. Somehow, for some reason, the only public health measures the administration embraces are those that harm immigrants, and it appears incapable of adopting measures that help them and preserve our collective public health. So what are some of our key concerns regarding COVID-19 and migration response? First of all, the conflation of COVID-19 and migration itself. I just looked this up. It appears that about 173 countries have issued travel bans of some sort upon the onset of this pandemic. But it's important to remember that COVID-19 is not a migration issue. The virus, of course, doesn't care about migration status. Conflating these two harkens back to the ugly history of treating migrants themselves as a sort of pathology, as disease carriers, a tradition that looks back to the Chinese Exclusion Act, to practices on Ellis Island, to restrictions on Haitian migration during the HIV AIDS crisis. We're also gravely concerned about the entrenchment of these new and restrictive norms, even after the pandemic. Autocrats weaponizing a pandemic to achieve long sought policy objectives that are going to be incredibly difficult to underwind, even uh, to, uh, to unwind, excuse me, even in the aftermath. 
There were reports that Trump, when asked about the CDC order summarily ending asylum, mused that perhaps it could continue after the pandemic. So how do we as advocates ensure that these measures do not become the status quo, particularly when people are making decisions that are often based in a visceral fear and, and a sort of visceral desire to protect one's own? Well, I think one of the key takeaways has been that COVID-19 has demonstrated our interconnectedness as a national and a global community. For some of us to be healthy, all of us have to be healthy, right? This is a version of the Anna Lazarus quote that until we are all free, we are none of us free. In the migration context, what does that mean? Well, first of all, every part of the deportation machine has to grind to a halt from enforcement to detention to deportation. And we cannot be allowed to suspend vital protections for asylum seekers and unaccompanied children simply by invoking this pandemic. Instead, policy choices must be grounded in the recommendations of public health experts. That means in this case, allowing asylum seekers to be paroled in, screened as necessary, and sheltered in place with their families and their loved ones. Finally, all persons, regardless of status, should have access to equal treatment and testing. The recent stimulus package passed by Congress excluded many immigrants from treatment, testing, and cash benefits, and dealt particularly severe blows to the millions of undocumented immigrants, the majority, many of whom pay taxes, and many of whom engage in essential work. For example, 75% of the farm worker force is undocumented, yet their work is deemed essential. They are out there working to ensure that you and I can have food on the table right now. So protecting people regardless of status is not just the correct thing to do from a human rights standpoint. It is also the best practice from the perspective of public health. I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. <clears throat> it's great to be with everyone um, and my co-panelists for their wonderful presentations. I'm Vince Warren. I'm the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights. And today I'm going to talk with you about uh, three areas that I think of, of detention and incarceration as vulnerable groups that I think are important and, and instructive in the moment. Um, I will start off by saying overall what we are seeing now and what we will continue to see is a uh, not just a conflation, but I think also a contradiction, a, a tension between public health initiatives and criminalization initiatives. And I call them criminalization initiatives um, because we're really not living in an era where um, the, our, our governments are putting forth neutral criminal justice policies, what we're seeing is that a lot of communities that have been criminalized and therefore flow into the, into the criminal system are now being held and being held not just in terms of having their limit, liberty limited, but now they're being held in essentially what are dish death boxes uh, in prison. So I wanna talk about three areas that are somewhat, um, that where there's a relation, but I think there's somewhat difference. One is a brief discussion about Guantanamo, um, both the origins and the current state of it. Two, I wanna talk about our prisons and jails. And then three, I wanna talk about a case that the Center for Constitutional File Rights filed just yesterday with respect to releasing folks from immigration detention. Overall, um, the public health what we've learned about the relationship between public health and detention is the following thing. Most people think that people are detained for legitimate reasons and therefore the public health question then gets layered in on top of that. But we actually find out that there, it actually happens in the other way around. And I'll give you an example from the early Guantanamo work. Um, and I'm not talking about the detainees that are there now. Um, because for over a year and a half, from 1991 to 1993, the United States government ran a special detention camp called Camp Bulkley at its naval base in Guantanamo Bay. And in one sense, that uh, camp represented just another episode of, this, of the glad, the sad global epic uh, denial of refugee rights um, that uh, Charanya uh, alluded to. But this camp was actually unique because during this time, there were 310 Haitian men, women, and children that were prisoners in the world's first and only detention camp for refugees with HIV. Uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights filed a lawsuit to have those uh, people released. But it was a challenging lawsuit. It was a challenging advocacy endeavor because at the time, there was massive hysteria that was swirling around about HIV, 
around AIDS, about immigrants, and about Haitians. Um, Haitians were seen as the group that, uh, beyond any other group, uh, that was essentially responsible for uh, the spread of HIV and AIDS. And as such, um, they got special treatment by being put in the world's first detention camp uh, for HIV and AIDS. The law um, barred entry of immigrants to immigrants with community communicable diseases unless a waiver was obtained. obtained. And unfortunately, at that point, HIV was deemed by the Surgeon General to be a communicable disease. And that we knew that since the beginning of the AIDS ec epidemic, Haitians in particular had been stigmatized unfairly as carriers. So we have a scenario where um, the public health rationale to prevent the spread of HIV AIDS in the United States was framed as a criminalization and uh, stigmatization of Haitians coming to the United States. So not only were the borders closed for that purpose, something that we're seeing um, similarly right now, but those people were detained um, in Guantanamo Bay in these camps. Uh, fortunately, the court in uh, 1991 uh, released all of the people from that camp and they also closed the camp, which is very significant. And I think it's going to be a key advocacy move that we're gonna be seeing uh, moving forward right now. Um, I wanted to talk to, about the back end of Guantanamo because, as you know, that there are 40 men that are being held in Guantanamo right now, which the Center for Constitutional Rights represents some of them. Um, and the situation is, is somewhat different in terms of the COVID-19 disease. There has been one reported case of COVID-19. It is not a Guantanamo detainee. It is a Navy officer that worked on the Guantanamo base. And what's interesting about the response there has been that the base has essentially been invited, divided in two. So there is the part of the base where the military operations and families live, which is on one side of the mountain, and on the other side of the mountains is where the detainees are housed. Um, the, the Department of Defense has taken steps to isolate that one um, Navy officer who is now in quarantine and isolation. He is separated from the entire base and the entire base is separated from the entire detention facility. The guards that are in Guantanamo guarding our clients are in the detention center with the uh, detainees at some level, keeping them safe from the spread of COVID-19 that's happening in the rest of the base. But here's the challenge that's, that's happening here. And this will be true of immigration detention, uh, detention in jails, detention in prisons, detention um, on Guantanamo, is that the main challenge right now with advocacy is that we have all been advocating and have been trying to tell people for many years and many decades in some cases that healthcare is inadequate. It is not only inadequate, it is abominable. It doesn't work. And so what we have now is a COVID-19 public health crisis that is now being superimposed on two things, an inadequate uh, uh, medical health system in detention and the inability to have people keep themselves safe through social um, isolation and things like that. Um, so in the Guantanamo context, two years ago, three years ago now, in 2017, we filed an emergency motion asking for an independent medical examination of one of our clients, uh, Shakawi al Haj, who was a Yemeni who'd been detained without charge in Guantanamo since 2004. He'd been held in secret detention and he'd been brutally tortured uh, for two years. And the argument that we made back in 2017 was that as a, as he was someone that was medically vulnerable, even without the COVID-19 epidemic, um, because he had been, prior to his detention, been um, diagnosed with hepatitis B virus um, and ex was experiencing chron chronic and potentially ominous related systems, including jaundice, extreme weakness, and fatigue, severe abdominal, abdominal pain. And we were asking the court for an emergency mo motion to have an independent medical examiner, a doctor of our choice, to be able to examine him. And even that motion, absent COVID-19, was denied. So that will tell you a little bit about how um, prison rules and national security rules and criminalization rules will almost always trump uh, the public health rationale. Um, when we think about detention uh, in the United States generally, um, again, the problem of prison health care in the best of times has always been inadequate. 
There is terrible infrastructure. People don't have soap. Uh, people need to understand in our domestic prisons and jails um, that people are not held in isolation like they are in the movies. People are housed together. At Rikers Island, um, the largest jail um, in the New York City area, uh, people are held in dormitories that are 50, there are 50 men in a dormitory. The women are held in dormitories as well. Uh, people sleep three to four feet away from each other and there is absolutely no ability for anybody in detention or prisons to be able to comply with the CDC guidelines. So the things that we are spending our time and energy doing, number one, keeping ourselves isolated from other people that potentially have the virus. Number two, keeping ourselves isolated if we feel, feel that we might have the virus. Number three, washing our hands all of the time. All of those things that um, we're, that the state is requiring and asking of us, all of those things are impossible under the current way that jails, prisons, and um, detention centers are being operated. And that, as I'll get to in a, in a slightly later point, is a, a very key advocacy point when it comes to getting people released. And we've seen that um, throughout the United States, uh, there has been great advocacy, particularly with respect to judges and um, district attorneys, to get people released. So um, there have been very key steps taken in San Francisco, in Boulder, Colorado, in uh, Ohio courts in Cuyahoga County and Hamilton County, uh, which on a single day released 38 people. Um, in Travis County, Texas, um, that they've been releasing more people from local jails on personal bonds, about 50% more than usual. Uh, Spokane, Washington, Florida, all around the country, these things have been happening. Now, What's important to remember here is that this is essentially an advocacy tool. So in order to act, in order to activate uh, what are reasonable public health guidelines, the, the state is not self-activating for any of our vulnerable communities. These are advocates that are making these, these things happen. And as such, it's very important that we in the advocacy community and, and you who are here and concerned about this issue take a couple of things very seriously. The first thing that needs to happen is that you have to dispense with the idea that criminalization and safety and fear around crime trumps the public health crisis. I probably shouldn't use the word Trump, but overshadows the public or is a higher priority than the public health crisis. The public health crisis is the number one priority. And because it's the number one priority, it actually, um, it, it, it lays bare all of the fissures and cracks and problems of the way that we incarcerate people right now. So the problem isn't uh, what are we to do? We can't release people into back into the community because they're dangerous, but at the same time, we can't keep them where they are uh, because they're gonna be exposed to the virus. That's the wrong way to think about it. The way, right way to think about it is because of the way that we've structured our jails and prisons. People are sitting ducks. It is a state responsibility to release people back into communities so that they can self-isolate and take the same measures uh, that we are. So it's important as advocates and for, for, for you all to really uh, not get caught up into the criminality and danger narrative because when we look at the, at the sp suspected number of deaths, even as we flatten the curve, which uh, end up being over 100,000 people, the number one risk that we have in this country and globally is not coming from people who are going to be released from jail and what they might do. The number one problem is what happens when we don't uh, allow people to isolate. Number two, with respect to jails, that I think is very important. Um, we should not allow jails and prison systems to use their form of isolation to be able to keep people safe. Because isolation for us means um, sheltering in place, staying at home, uh, worrying about whether the Wi-Fi works, trying to keep the, the kids occupied while you're working. Isolation in jails and prisons is essentially punitive. It, it ends up being solitary confinement, which is a form of torture, which uh, not only will which, which may or may not keep people safe with respect to COVID-19, but it will worsen their underlying conditions, their mental health and other things that will ultimately make them more susceptible. And we can't have a situation where we have 2.3 million people that are currently in jails and prisons, isolated in solitary confinement. Um, 
The last note I want to make is that um, yesterday, the Center for Constitutional Rights and the National Immigration Project of the National Lawyers Guild sued for the release of 17 medically vulnerable people currently held in five immigration detention centers, citing the severe risk of their contracting the coronavirus and uh, developing uh, COVID-19 symptoms. Um, the five immigration centers um, are based in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. They are all notoriously overcrowded. They are all notoriously healthy. One has had litigation filed for years about the lack of adequate medical facilities, the lack of expertise. And the reason why this case uh, we think is an important intervention is because with the advent of COVID-19, with, with that coming into play, it is only further uh, uh, threatening and harming the people that are detained there. And we have to remember that these are people that are detained on civil and not criminal immigration uh, statuses. The 17 detainees uh, include men and women. It is gender and racially diverse. Our lead plaintiff is an African, uh, excuse me, is an, uh, an Afro-descended woman from Nigeria that has a compromised health system. It also includes two hunger strikers that had been already protesting <clears throat> their detentions in the conditions of confinements and whose bodies have been weakened through their protest and through the lack of medical care. Um, and it makes them um, especially uh, at risk for what's happening. Danger of low blood pressure, risk of organ failure, uh, all of those things. But I wanted to sort of throw out the question of immigration detention in the context of the broader questions, because at the end of the day, um, we as advocates, um, very much just like uh, Amnesty International has said, and CCR takes this perspective as well, people need to be released without condition, and they need to be released without carving them up into safety categories, meaning the older people are safer than the younger people, the women are safer than the men, the pregnant women are safe, the people who are pregnant are safer than the people who are not pregnant. That is not a way, that's a way to ration out uh, rational, a, a criminal paradigm, but it is no way to do public safety. One thing that we can say clearly at this point is that our way of incarcerating people is inconsistent with public safety inconsistent with public safety. The walls have been brought down because of the coronavirus and we need to start actualizing that and rethinking the way that we incarcerate people to begin with. Okay, well, thank you to the whole panel uh, for really highlighting an extraordinary range of impacts that are also intersectional and also really reminding us that these impacts are not occurring in a vacuum. They're occurring in a context of existing inequalities and in a context where governments have already engaged in rights violative policies from the immigration space to detention space to women's rights space as well. I'm having a whole bunch of questions come through that I think sort of roughly come into three categories. The first set of questions is around understanding what the full impacts look like, um, you know, particularly given that we're in a space where governments are engaging in misinformation, access to marginalised groups can be particularly difficult um, in terms of not being able to go to prisons or not being able to um, document domestic violence and, and so forth. How are advocates on the ground thinking about negotiating those fact-finding challenges in the current moment? Amanda? Maybe, maybe I can yeah, jump in there. Okay, I mean, I, I want to start by saying you know, Grassroots organizations and organizations, particularly in the global south and in uh, communities throughout the United States, they're on the front line both of supporting their membership and, and their communities and really flagging what are significant concerns coming out of their communities. Uh, and, and in a world where everything is virtual and, and, and travel is not possible, for practitioners, we really th need to be thinking about what does fact finding look like that is both um, consistent with public health recommendations, recognizes and reflects the need to prioritize stress and resilience and mental health of both uh, practitioners themselves and the communities and the organizations that we work alongside. Um, and so I think that there is a lot of work that's being done just to, to think 
how can we continue the important role of fact finding in a time where um, in many ways our methodology is being flipped a bit on its head. So I, I wanted to recognize that and then to say, um, you know, one way to ensure that we make visible the full impact is that we are calling very clearly for recovery efforts that monitor at a dis disaggregated way um, the re-entry into both workforce and education and other um, other areas that have been disrupted by the the um, the, the virus itself and then the, the response to it. That's really difficult when we have a number of populations that are not visible in the first place in that data and that. Um, and, and so I, I wanna flag that in many ways, the crisis that we're seeing, which is both a public health and an economic crisis, and, and the hope is not also a human rights crisis, is reflective of, of the world that was built. I mean, when, um, women cannot access the healthcare they need, that's because the system hasn't prioritized how to make sure that women can access that healthcare even at a crisis. Um, when children are a part of, you know, not a, they're not able to access education because of a digital divide, it's because that digital divide didn't matter until now um, for many policymakers around the world. And so while advocates and, and practitioners and fact finders are having to kind of shift and think about how in this acute phase we can support on the ground fact finding, we also need to think about what are the facts that are necessary in order to build a recovery effort that's more rights respecting. And one of the things that I think that we can be doing and calling for um, immediately is that if you look at who are the policymakers right now making choices around public health responses or even recovery, economic recovery responses, it's not reflective of the communities most impacted by the the harmful the potential harm in, in in these policies and so you know there's been so much work done over the last 20 years thinking about women peace and security and engaging political participation and women's participation and really thinking through the specific needs of, of integration of women and gender into into peacemaking and so there's a lot of analogies that we can pull through our collective bodies of work to support or a more inclusive and rates respecting a policy making around these issues. Um, so that, that's a starting point. I think the question of understanding the full impact, one of the things that we can do is dig into to our toolbox and highlight the thing, the issues that we cared about prior to this, this epidemic and think about how it's going to play out in the course of it. For example, if women and girls can't inherit, if there are difficulties inheriting land, how will they be dispossessed of land or particularly at risk of, of homelessness or evictions or otherwise um, um, left without, without access to, to resources in the context of this crisis. Um, when we're thinking about moratoriums, water and sanitation, it was never appropriate to cut off water for, for failure to pay. What does it mean in a crisis like this that there are jurisdictions around the world that are still cutting off water for failure to pay or refusing to actually reconnect water that's been cut off? So I think really going back to, to our tool set, going back to our uh, bread and butter, what it is as practitioners we know well and applying it to the current context and thinking about how we can actually insert into any effort to respond or re recover from this crisis a more rights respecting way to, to just operate around the world. And I think um, it's not opportunism, but it's, it's taking this moment to envision a more rights respecting world. Anyone else want to add to that? I can go to my second set of questions. Sure, I'll just add one quick thing, and that's the role of government transparency. So right now, it's not even just us as human rights reporters and um, monitors, but also even journalists who are unable to do that work of monitoring and reporting in the same in the same way, using the same modalities. Um, they too are, are seeing their you know their mode their like their modes of operating really dramatically shifted. Um, in the midst of this pandemic. So to offer one concrete example, something we're calling upon the government to do is, you know, in light of this new border order um, that summarily expels asylum seekers, we're demanding that they, you know, periodically report on demographics, on, um, you know, on where these people are going, on what they look like, because there truly is no other way to access this information other than the government giving, giving it to us, just because our ability to monitor is so deeply constrained. Um, and so that's something that I think is really important. Um, I know that different agencies have had different levels of transparency. Um, 
immigration and customs enforcement, it, Vince mentioned, um, you know, the interior enforcement immigration detention is run by ICE. Um, they have been periodically reporting on, you know, COVID, um, people who test positive for COVID um, in immigration detention. However, border authorities, um, notably Customs and Border Protection, have said, we are not going to report publicly on staff or detainees who test positive for COVID. That is alarming. Um, at the same time, we're seeing this unprecedented new power that, um, that border authorities are invoking. We're also hearing them say, and we're not going to tell you about what we do. Um, and that's, that is super, super concerning. So demanding transparency right now, um, given our own constrained abilities to monitor, is critical. Yes, Jane, if I can jump in, and I totally agree with you. Another piece is, um, you know, particularly when we're talking about prisons and jails, um, we're in a situation now, since no one can travel there, the people that have the information, the data that we want, are the prisoners themselves, mm -hmm. family members, and the people that have been working with them for years. And so when we think about Center for Constitutional Rights as a human rights organization, this is actually not about building empires so that we're aggregating information. We should be supporting uh, the information that's already being generated. So, um, you know, I think that the, the for, for advocates, the number one rule is if you don't have relationships in those jails and those communities now, just think about supporting somebody else rather than writing a big report because you can't get there and you can't get the information. Um, and, so, and, and another piece for, for advocates generally is that we can also think about the marginalized communities that we are talking about and that we're working with have systems of getting information out and to us and experiencing it ways before there was an internet, before there was a Zoom call and before there was COVID-19. So going back to um, connecting with the information that is being generated, the demands that are being uh, uh, sent out from people in jail, uh, the being able to work with um, independent journalists who are also pulling that information out becomes really key. Finally, um, that what you really need right now um, in the jail context is the health experts and the people that have been talking about how horrible the conditions are say, we, this is a fact that we know. The thing that we don't know and that's still emerging is the effect of COVID-19 on this terrible fact. And that should be enough to at least prompt um, a, this, an advocacy discussion with decision makers um, saying that we can, since we can't fix the thing that we know and we don't know this other thing, what we need to do is we need to get people out of that situation. Yeah, thank you, Vince. You really actually foreshadowed one of the questions um, that we had, which is around exactly like how do you sort of work with those marginalized groups to you know, ensure there's an amplification of the impacts they're experiencing like in, in these ways. And um, we have a whole bunch of questions that go to better understanding the impact on certain groups. And I'll just note that we will have more events in our series that will do a deeper dive on trying to understand, for example, impacts on refugees, on persons with disabilities. But we do have a bunch of questions that particularly go to uh, Sharanya around understanding migrant workers' impacts um, outside the United States. So I'm um, just reading one of the questions is about, you know, we've, we've seen reports of um, targeting of migrant workers in India and Africa, of spraying migrant workers with disinfectant and requiring them to walk long distances home. Um, how do we fully understand those impacts? Um, and a related question that's going to throw this one in there too is how do we protect uh, refugees and asylum seekers from the increased surveillance um, being put forward as part of the COVID 19 response? So, Shania and then Amanda. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, starting with the question of, of migrant workers, I think this goes to the point that I think Vince and Amanda both made, which is that the situation, like the status quo ante, was so horrific and so exploitative, and we know that layering a pandemic on top of it, um, the situation can only get worse. Um, I think a favorite tool of um, autocrats around the world is xenophobia and scapegoating. And it's really, really tempting and really easy to do that and see that in this context. And we see that around the world in the situations you mentioned um, in India to right here in the United States. Um, and what I find particularly troubling about the states, which is the context I know best, is just that at the same time we're demonizing immigrants, we're also relying on their labor to survive. Um, and they are at the forefront of pandemic response. And yet, even Congress failed to realize that um, in passing the stimulus measure that left out a huge swath of individuals. And, and doing that is not only cruel and like that's reason enough not to do it, but it's also a terrible idea because we need, we need to all have access to health in order for all of us to be safe. It's not enough to cover just a segment of the population without offering holistic coverage because that, that endangers all of us. And that's 
that's really what I think that, that that should be a lesson of the pandemic that we are a like a single social fabric and we need to act accordingly and protect each other and all of us. Um, as to the question about surveillance um, of refugees and asylum seekers, it is a huge concern. Um, an element of this new regime at the border is sort of like rapid fire biometric processing for individuals who cross between ports of entry. Um, and we understand that that is only to capture individuals who have, who potentially who present potential um, risks to public safety so they can further be detained or what have you. Um, but certainly like the collection of, of this data without understanding where it's going, and that again speaks to this issue of transparency, not understanding how this regime is operating because the government is failing to be transparent about it, is invoking a sort of emergency justification for that. Um, and then um, and then refusing to tell us what's actually going on. And that's why I think it's so important to continue to demand transparency out of our government and others. Yeah, I just wonder if like, and you know, one of our big concerns, of course, is with migrant domestic workers, because so often migrant domestic workers are, you know, if they're going to be sheltering in place, they're going to be sheltering in place and, and actually providing caregiving responsibilities and likely increase caregiving responsibilities at a time where they're going to be less visible, less access, able to access um, services or even information outside the home. And so that's a particularly vulnerable migrant population, but more generally when there are um, inability to travel, when migrant workers are being detained or put into quarantine um, and not able to access sufficient health care, there, there are a number of concerns that start to really unravel. And when there is a whole regime set up in some countries to address abuses within the migrant or migrant worker, migrant domestic worker communities, those systems, just like a domestic violence shelter, may not be working in this current context. And so, you know, um, that this is a broad swath of, of individuals around the world that have a particular vulnerability that need um, specific responses that go from everything to ensuring that their rights respecting quarantines or rights respecting um, that they still have access to wages that they have access to the ability to travel if they need to um, and that they have access to services if they're facing abuse in their workplace I have a, another set of questions which will be our last um, set in our remaining time a lot of um, people who've been attending um, the session have really wanted to talk about what happens next? Like, how do we look forward in thinking through like, what are human rights compliant, what an intersectional approach to remedying um, these impacts on marginalized groups might look like? So we have questions that are asking, for example, Vince to reflect on like how best to instruct judges to um, assist vulnerable communities. We have questions, a lot of questions about reproductive health and reproductive rights and trying to understand what the position of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International is on protecting the rights to reproductive um, care um, during the pandemic. So if you could, although I know it's a little bit um, not sufficient, but if you could all potentially just reflect briefly on what a major call for action looks like going forward um, from the perspective of your organisations and issues on which you work. Amanda, do you want to start? Sure. Um, and, you know, we highlighted a variety of areas that we're watching and concerned of. And so there are a lot of different policy responses for, for any number of those. And um, I highlighted we're really digging into the, the countries where there are um, inconsistencies, inheritance and succession laws to make sure that those are secure and in place in, in the event that um, women need to be able able to um, have access to those secure property rights on issues related to reproductive rights, ensuring that some of the barriers to being able to access at-home abortion care are lifted um, either by the FDA in the United States or by other authorities and, and, and countries around the world and ensuring, you know, we're starting to monitor and thinking through whether or not there will be delays and, and challenges in supply chains, but also as we start to lose healthcare workers um, that are typically providing uh, reproductive health care, how are women, uh, to, and, losing them in, in, in the fight against the, this um, terrible epidemic, how do we ensure that women and girls continue to keep access to services if they aren't able to, um, to, to access the care that they, they used to be able to provide? So we're still thinking through kind of the long term and the acute phase, we're really fighting against this opportunism by anti-choice governments and individuals who try to have access to essential health care. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it there so everybody has a chance to, to weigh in. Thank you, uh, Sharon, and then Vince. Sure, yeah, I'm just reminded of this really great piece in Slate called uh, America is a Sham, and I highly recommend you check it out um, if you haven't already. 
But it sort of talks about how all of these arbitrary rules and restrictions have been unwound um, as a result of the pandemic. So for example, I mean, the, the opening example was just bringing in a bottle of um, hand sanitizer that's greater than the three ounces typically required on a plane. All of a sudden it's fine to bring in a 12 ounce bottle of hand sanitizer. That's a very minor example, but then it goes on to talk about um, you know, moratoriums on, ev on eviction in the wake of, of COVID. That's a good thing, but why are we ev evicting people who are potentially facing life-threatening emergencies pre-COVID or post-COVID? And I apply that same logic to a lot of the architecture of detention and deportation. So for example, why is it that our first response to asylum seekers at the border is to stuff them in overcrowded and unsanitary cages? That was never okay. Um, it's obviously not okay now, but it wasn't okay before. And the same goes for this blanket arbitrary practice of immigration detention in the United States. Why is it that we detain close to 40,000 people um, as our average daily population? That's not, that, 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 that wasn't okay before COVID. It's not okay now. And I think um, this pandemic is causing us to re-examine some of those practices, um, seeing more mainstream acceptance of the decarceration movement, which of course has existed separate and apart from COVID and should continue to exist. And my hope is that we can look at some of these practices that we suspended or reevaluated um, in light of their public health risks and also think about them through the lens of human rights, whether these were ever okay to begin with. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I, um, I would say that the intersectional approach that we're thinking about the, at the Center for Constitutional Rights is one that really is trying to use this moment to build the world that we want rather than to fight against the millions of things that we don't want. By the way, all of those millions of things will be happening in the next uh, three, to half, three and a half months if they're not happening already. So number one, you know, we live in a time where we in this country, and I think, and actually internationally, that we're relying on the concepts of bands, borders, and walls to keep us safe. And the problem is, is that we, every time that we have a situation um, like a like a COVID-19 pandemic, the instinct is to build the bands, uh, to make the bands more active, to build the walls higher, um, and to keep people out. And it's the exact opposite thing that we need to do. Just like we have to act against our instincts to sort of not go to work. It's the same way that we have to think about the bands, borders, and walls that they have to come down because we're not gonna keep ourselves safe by keeping people in isolation and excluding folks. It's just not gonna happen. Number two, um, we have to be very clear about the role of militarization that is coming. Uh, we know that um, the, in the third stimulus package that came out, there were millions and millions of dollars that went to law enforcement. For what? It said that it would keep the law enforcement officers safe, but we know that that's actually not what's going to happen. If we even go back to um, after the AIDS epidemic, as soon as the uh, funding was, was happening with respect to giving money to law enforcement to, and states for uh, AIDS uh, uh, services, it was contingent on those states creating a criminalization regime for people spit, for example, spitting on folks that have AIDS, even though spitting on people was not a, a, a way to, to transmit the disease. So we're going to see a lot of those things. And the intersectional approach is one in which that those of us that are working in particular areas are very attentive to other areas as well. So for people that are not working in reproductive health, when you're thinking about um, the idea of what is medically necessary, and then we find that these states are now saying, well, you know what's not medically necessary is abortions. So we'll just go ahead and, and, and try to ban those things under a public health uh, rationale. We have to be in attentive to those things. We have to be attentive to uh, uh, First Nations, Native Americans, immigrant communities, Black, queer, trans communities, disabled communities about how these uh, public health rationales are going to be weaponized. Because the thing that we know is that public health, at least in the, in the context of the United States, has never actually been about helping and keeping the public healthy. It's about creating buckets of exclusion um, and, and categories of hierarchy um, that restrict people's ability to get the resources that they need. And now is the opportunity for us to ask as a global community, let's do something different. Let's lean into the thing that we have been, that the state has been so afraid of, uh, letting people out of jail, uh, giving people opportunity to, uh, to not um, have to pay back their loans, um, not have people evicted. This is the moment for us to come together on all of those things.
Thank you uh, to a really um, extraordinary panel for helping to amplify the, the challenges, but also the opportunities um, in the current moment. Um, and I encourage everyone to join the next event in our series, which is next Tuesday, April 7, which will be exploring COVID-19's impact on health, housing, water, and sanitation, um, looking particularly at the concept of socioeconomic rights in crisis. Um, and we'll continue this conversation about the ways in which mm. access and enjoyment of economic, social, and cultural rights um, is highly mediated um, based upon a number of different entities. So thank you again to our panel for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for organizing it.